Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10, broadcasting on channels television, live from Lagos, Nigeria. A reminder of our top stories. The federal government promises to equip the military to dislodge Boko Haram as security forces repel another attack on Meiduguri. President Buhari vows to investigate cases of political assassinations and kidnappings in the country and bring perpetrators to book. Some state governors plan desperate measures to pay salaries of civil servants. Workers in Ocean State reject pay cut. And Greeks fleet on tomorrow's referendum as preparations get underway at polling stations across the country. All our top stories can be found on our website, channelstv.com, and on youtube.com forward slash channels web. To view us live, visit M. To view us live on your mobile device, you can visit m.channelstv.com. You can also download the Channels TV app for Android, iOS, and Windows phones from their respective stores. We urge you to please interact with the eyewitness feature on the Channels TV app on Android, iOS, and Windows 8 platforms. If you have pictures or videos you'd like to share with us, tap the application on your device, swipe to reveal the eyewitness menu, and follow the instructions to share. Desperate times call for desperate measures, they say, and the financial crisis facing some states in the country appears to lend credence to the statement as various state governments take steps to address the challenge. Governor Tanko Almakura of Nasarawa State has introduced a development levy to save the funds for development of the state and curb borrowing to augment local government staff and civil servant salaries. He says this will be deducted from all salary earners in the state, including civil servants. Governor Al Makura receiving the three volume transition appraisal committee report at the government house last year. The report identifies the increasing wage bill of the state and insecurity as major challenges which the governor quickly moves to address by introducing the development levy. I would like to say without any fear of contradiction that a situation where the whole amount that comes to the local government is paid completely as salaries and also to go again and do for augmentation either by law or by some other means at the expense of the ordinary farmer, the fisherman, <coughs> the drivers and other categories of people that make up the state, I think we need to think again. A situation where a state should go and borrow money only to pay 1% of the people at the expense of 99%, I consider that as unacceptable. It will be a state policy from now on that every individual in the state who has any form of wage or salary from the state coffers must pay development ready for the survival of the state. While the governor made the pronouncement, the local government chairman rose from the meeting to explain the issue of local government wage bill. The chairman said they resorted to paying salary in percentages as they could no longer continue with bank overdrafts to augment the dwindling federal allocation. This is the position we are. If we continue to collect overdraft, definitely there will be a day that local governments council will not be able to pay even 10% salary. Because you can see, when we started with 550 million, the next time they receive their money, the moment we got allocation, they removed that 550 with 37%, and the second time we have to go for 950. So it is wise for us not to continuously and continually depending on overdraft. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the position we are. We have to take this critical decision to save the local government from total collapse, total anarchy, and system adaptation. The steps taken by the governor and the local government became necessary to remedy the situation where allocation accruing to the state is spent only on salaries while other responsibilities of government suffer. 
Workers in Oshun State have resolved to resist an alleged plan by the state government to slash their salaries by 50%. At a meeting with leaders of various unions in the state capital, Oshubu, the state chairman of the Nigerian Labour Congress, Mr. Jacob Adekwami, threatened that any attempt to cut workers' wages by any percentage would be resisted. The state government has been accused of introducing pay cut for teachers and local government workers from grade level 8 to 17. We are not consulted. This is a democratic setting. You see, we, we, have, we are not in the jungle. You cannot just wake up on the wrong side of your bed and say you want to implement this policy. The policy, whatever you want to do that affects the life of human beings, those people, your boss will say, I fairy lorry, like your lawyer lorry. You see, you have to consult all the labor leaders, you have to negotiate before we reach compromise. That is never that has not has not been done and we have never been called. So that is why we are saying in its entirety, we are rejecting it. Nigeria's image in the international community seems to have brightened, giving hope for better relations with countries of the world, and this is especially due to President Muhammadu Buhari's perception of corruption. Well, this is according to the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Bulus Lolo, who told journalists in Abuja oh, that the President's resolve to fight corruption is the reason why many countries have pledged to work with his administration. He pointed out that the ministry is working despite the delay in appointing a substantive minister. Is out there, the way he is perceived is that he has the credentials, he has the pedigree as an incorruptible leader. A foreign leader has described him as someone who is known for his scrupulous honesty. I think to use that adjective to describe our president is an endorsement that we all should be proud of and a sign of hope that Nigeria has stepped forward again. Studies have shown that if we can only block 25% of the leakages in our system through corrupt acts, we will mobilize sufficient resources to undertake key government programs and projects successfully. No one in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs will have the inclination, talk less of the motivation to question when ministers will be appointed. When Mr. President is ready, he will unfold his list. And whether or not that delay will affect us, you are free to check whether this ministry has not been able to carry out its constitutional functions because there are no ministers. And my answer to that is the ministry is working as it should. The Port Harcourt refinery is expected to begin production soon as rehabilitation work hits 90%. This is according to the managing director of the Port Harcourt Refining Company in River State, Mr. Bafred Ndrugu. He says the facility constitutes 47% of the nation's total petroleum products production capacity. Our correspondent, Emmanuel Ere, visited the refinery and now reports. This is the Port Harcourt Refinery in Alessa, Elemay, River State. Engineers and technicians are busy tightening the bolts and nuts to ensure the installations are ready for the refining of crude. The manager and director of the company says the current rehabilitation exercise on the facility is near completion. I'm very prepared and very excited at the prospect of coming back on screen. We expect to start production middle of the month. We have just gone through a process of rehabilitation. This facility, as important as it is, has not received that routine intervention in a while. The last time we had that was in the year 20, 2000. That's quite a long while. That has 
put the facility in some state of deterioration. Some of the men on site take us round to see things for ourselves. They assure us that the facility is 100% run by Nigerians. The job you are looking up there is the most strategic. It has never been done before. And it, uh, in fact, we had to come here up to three times to convince them we can do it. The refining complex comprises of all the new refineries with a combined refining capacity of 210,000 barrels per day. However, the chairman of Pengerson at Port Harcourt Refinery identifies possible itches to the proposed target. When I speak with you now, we will be expecting crude, and as soon as that happens, uh, and having to having undergone this uh, rehabilitation, if we can match both, definitely this prospect of um, uh, getting back on track will be actualized. I'm currently standing in the premises of the Port Harcourt Refining Company in Alessa Eleme in River State. Behind me is Area 1 installation. Authorities here tell us that at the completion of the rehabilitation process going on in the facility, the PHRC will be set to close the demand gap by producing 5 million litres of petrol per day for public consumption. Emmanuel Ire, Channels Television News. Well, joining me now to focus more on that development story is the editor at large of Energia Today, Mr. Olabode Shomi, who joins me live from our studio in Abuja, where we're hoping to connect with him. And when we do connect with him, we'll be taking a closer look at that particular story. Well, Mr. Shomi joins me now from the studio. We apparently have fixed the technical issues that we had. Mr. Shomi, thank you so much for joining me on the news at 10. Now, what do you think has been responsible for the, been responsible for the death of the nation's refineries? Uh, well, I think it's important to understand the issues with um, our refineries as a whole. But um, because we don't want to write a book, it will be good to start from 2011. I think in 2011, at the end of the, the administration, one of the things that was decided was that they should get in touch with the ORB, that's the original refinery builders, to do a turnaround maintenance. They, they were contacted, but they declined to be a part of the project. And, um, but they nominated partners for that. It took about two years of negotiations with those partners, but they came up with prohibitive figures in terms of their costs. It should be understood that those part, they were not competitive bids because there were, there were specific recommendations from the ORBs. At the end of the day, they refused to give guarantees on the turnaround. And that was when NMPC decided to look inwards. And they used, well, in accordance with the spirit and the letter of the Local Content Act, they used local engineers to do the turnaround. My understanding is that by August of October of last year, 2014, there was um, the project commenced, having ensured that there was a steady flow of income. I mean, steady flow of income for the job. And sometime later this month, we are expecting that, and I mean, the Portacot refinery will go on full scale. I also understand that Kaduna, as well as Wari, are in advanced stages, 60 and I think 70 percent in, respectively, in both cases. Now set out, or the federal government has actually now set out on the right path with regards to resuscitating these refineries. Don't forget that most of the equipment are obsolete, and so it's going to be a really, really tough job for them. Well, engineering is engineering. In terms of uh, certain adaptations, yes, we could have certain things that will that will need uh, improvement. But, but I mean, they're going to need boilers. They're going to need certain things which are basic. What has also happened is that they are involving um, OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, for some of the add-ons, so that there are improvements. But you see, aside from the engineering of the process itself, it's important to also look at the infrastructure, which is critical to the delivery of the services. And by that, I'm talking about pipelines, we're talking about the midstream activities. It should be understood that in 2007, 2008, there was a hydro testing of some of the pipelines 
them that mark the route from a portal cut through worry and hydro testing basically means um when a pipeline is const constructed they will put water through it to test it for gaps and other problems that it could have they found out that people complained that their houses were flooded i think in Aba, in ossisioma and co and what was the reason for that a number of people had vandalized the pipelines and drawn pipe uh, parts of it to their homes and these are cases in Arepo, these are cases in uh, Mosimi, cases in Abba. So even when the refinery is concluded and is producing, there, there are still issues with respect to delivery. In the case of uh, the protocol refinery that I talked, I mean, the hydro testing that I talked about, 5 million liters of water was pumped. Only 1.5 million liters was recovered at the other end. So looking at the situation as it is with regards to fuel scarcity that we've had, you know, resurfacing at fuel stations across the country and a lot of um, expectations for the Port Harcourt refinery coming on stream and actually trying to alleviate this situation, do you think that in the short to medium term, there's a definitive stance that can be taken? Of course, we're talk a lot of talk has been on about removal of the fuel sub subsidy. But before that actually comes, what do you think can be done in the short to medium term to you know, address this situation we have that's talking about the fuel scarcity across the country? I think the, the, the way forward, I mean, the way forward is part of the steps that they are taking. There is no doubt that we need to improve local capacity. However, it is not something that is going to be magic. It's going to take time. We are going to have to evolve as we see a culture that needs to accommodate and accept the fact that we want the refineries to work. Uh, when you look at the figures, I think we have about 40 million liters of uh, PMS that we use per day, which is also growing because, I mean, I mean but I haven't said that. Even with the three refineries, when they function at 100%, we are expecting about 34 to 35 million liters from there. But that is a theoretical amount in the sense that we are expecting that to be, I mean, we're expecting everything to work well, the, the, the pipelines will work well, the refinery itself will not have um, attenuation or any losses. But in reality, that does not really happen. So what we are expecting that will happen is that we'll continue to work on our local capacity and this will be augmented by some of the processes that is already taking place for there to be realistic um, improvement in society. Mr. Shomi, thank you so much for joining me on the News at 10. Thank you very much. Still ahead on the News at 10, Nigeria's interbank lending rates ease to its lowest since interest rates was pegged at 13%. That's on Business News. Please join us again. <laughs>